striped shirts work for a park service called Delaware North. I mean, we don't, NASA doesn't have time to send its people out here to, you know, play fun and games with all these nice folks. And, you know, they, they've got other things to think about, like black holes and alpha magnetic spectrometers and all that kind of stuff. But so they, they send people like me out to do the job. But uh, NASA outsources everything. Uh, the big tank is made in New Orleans, Louisiana. The um, rocket boosters are made in uh, the Thiokol plant in Utah. Um, you know, all of the pieces. The, the orbiter itself was made by Rockwell in Palmdale, California. You know, all of these people bid for the job, and the person who gets the bid, of course, the person who does it the best and the cheapest. Yes? Not being an American, how would you say how to this is? Not much. <laughs> on the initial, on the first flight, how much? Nothing. What about the brains behind it? Were all American? Actually, the majority of the brains behind it were um, German imports. Uh, Werner von Braun was a big guiding light, and he had surrendered to the United States after World War II. Uh, the whole idea of the shuttle was Eugene Sanger's in 1929. And Eugene Sanger, of course, was did this with his little bride at the Polytechnic when they were graduating from school. That was their little dream, is to go off to the moon in a reusable <coughs> spacecraft. And they, you know, so we borrowed a lot of ideas from a lot of brilliant, brilliant physicists. And, um, you know, we certainly, we, we did inherit a lot of good stuff, but, um, you know, there were certainly a lot of good American minds. We had Goddard and a few others, but yeah, a lot of good German minds. Other questions, folks? Yes. You know the tile? Yes. Uh, is it only visual, high visual, material that's damaged, or is it something that measures? No, just visual. Just a visual look. They'll scan it. Now, the other thing you folks asked me about was food. I just happen to have a few pieces of food here. This is cashews, looks like cashews, okay? Cashews are okay. What we have is sealed them, just like you'd seal them if you were taking a trail mix pack. Okay, that's no big deal. Um, let's see, what have I got here? This happens to be smoked turkey. Good for supper tonight, but it but feels like rubber in there because there's no fluid. Okay, what we have to do is when we open this, up, well, it says here, smoked turkey, and it tells it in Russian as well. Tells, gives you directions. What we have to do is heat this up in the microwave, and they do have a microwave oven up there, okay? Then um, this is rice pilaf, and you see there's a little thing here, a tube? We have to inject water, and the instructions tell us that we need 100 milliliters of hot water for five to 10 minutes, and then we have rice pilaf for supper, okay? Um, what else have I got here? Sweet and sour beef. Okay, um, and it tells me the directions in Russian, so I don't know, but it's gushy in here, so I think I just heat this up. And um, these look like prunes. What are we here? Dried apricots. Okay. Yeah, they're pretty bad, huh? I don't want to eat those apricots. Anyway, okay, this one is applesauce. It feels gushy. I guess I could just eat it right out of the pack. Now, when they're in space, folks, because we're in free fall, right? Things don't hold on, you know, you have to hold on to the, so we have Velcro here to hold it on to our little tray, okay? And you peel this open, and you just hope that since we're all traveling at 17,500 miles an hour, it doesn't go very far. But if you start, if you start playing with your food, that's easy to do, because, you know, for example, if you, if you have something, I, um, let me see here. Okay, if you open this up and it's mushy, and, and you open it up, and all you have to do is give it the slightest impulse, and it just floats, okay? And then you go, try and catch it, that sort of thing. But they play with their food all the time, like two-year-olds, these guys. They, they, get a big, they get a big bang out of it. But that's food. Any other questions? What does it take to become an astronaut? Easy. You can do it, okay? <laughs> Honest. Being an astronaut is no big deal, except that you have to be super brave, super disciplined. And when I say discipline, that's probably the hardest thing for most of us. Because when you think they had to lay almost three hours on their back on a metal slab without complaining, okay? I mean, those kinds of things. And the training, last year when they decided on this trip, they have a nine-day trip. So what they do is rehearse it like you rehearse a play. They go through the whole nine-day scenario over and over again. Because if they've got seven people in that little room, you know, they've got to know what they're, where they're going all the time. You know, they can't say, oh, well, sorry, guys, I want to be over here. No, 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 you, I, you know, they can't do that. And so they have to plan where they're going to go, who goes to the right, who goes to the left, who's in the 
uh, cargo bay, who's where, and they rehearse this over and over again, like rehearsing a play. So they know everything that they have to do. And they also have to go through all the possible scenarios of what could happen. So it's very disciplined and takes a lot of thought. However, physically, the requirements are that you be fi between five feet and six feet, six inches tall. Most of us can fill that. Also, requires that you have a blood pressure no greater than 160 over 90. I mean, if my blood pressure got that high, I'd be in a hospital, I think, okay? Secondly, we had to be, have eyes that are correctable to 2050. You can wear glasses, guys. And the big kicker is you can't be colorblind. You have to be able to see red from green, which for obvious reasons, if you saw a red light on that panel, you gotta know it, right? So, it, but basically those are the physical requirements. Now, as far as education is concerned, they do require that you have at least, at least a bachelor in science degree in either um, the math or the sciences or engineering because that's pretty well important. I have to tell you honestly that every one of the astronauts, the 137 that I know of, okay, there are 137 active astronauts right now, just about all of them are PhDs. Some of them are triple PhDs and MDs. So they're really bright guys, okay? Now the thing is, what you're doing there is you were chosen to go into space for a specific job. And so you have astrophysicists going up to do experiments in astrophysics. You have doctors going up to do physiology or biology or whatever. And um, the last one on Columbia, they took up some veterinarians because they took up animals, okay? Now the, as far as being in the military, it is not required. Only the commander and the pilot need to be able to fly a plane. And it used to be that they were military men, but that's not necessary. You just have to have the training to be able to handle it. <laughs> Otherwise, if you want to be an astronaut, no. stop at the information counter, ask them for NASA's address, send them your resume, and go for it, guys. Dream big, right? OK, any other questions? Yes? The money that's made here at the Space Center, does it go back into the space program? No. The money that's made here at the Space Center, the, uh, from the gift shop and the food, that pays my salary. <laughs> goes to Delaware North. Yeah, you, we t cannot charge money to come here because this is a federal place. And so in order to provide you with buildings like this, to create the displays, to um, you know, do the upkeep, to keep it clean, we have to get money somehow and we get it from souvenirs and food. We don't own the buses, so we don't charge for the bus tours, the bus companies do. We don't own the IMAX, so the IMAX people, they charge for the IMAX movie. Folks, you've been wonderful. Absolutely super califagilistic, expialidocious, and they're still discussing here. Let's see what they've got. Folks, um, they're going to try and make me close this in about 10 minutes. Now, I can't make you do anything, but if you want to stick around and ask questions for the next three hours, that's all right. But I, I might have to go home. <laughs> <laughs> yes? It's okay. But, um, uh, Cindy came by and she said Tracy told me to. And the community on the two burn discovery now in a 177 by 129 article mile high orbit. All the time. That's why they walk around the bomb and back and first thing. It's very good to be up there. I think they don't want to show you. It's quite a bit of a bit of a bit of a bit of on board Discovery, uh, Discovery will continue to make its approach towards the mirror for the docking currently planned for Thursday, just before 12 noon Central Time. So the thing that holds it all together is the fact that these three engines put the direction going at an angle, and the force is constantly pushing towards the center of gravity of this. Now the fuel is constantly coming out, right? And eventually, See these three engines? They wiggle, okay? And so they keep moving out and out and out so that the force goes continuous, okay? This is a secret. I just don't have one to give everybody. That's my problem.
Thank okay. you. Okay. He's going to fetch Cole. Right. Right. <laughs> better. We're going to try and synchronize our orbit better. But the thing is, it, it, when they first go up, they start out in a low elliptical orbit, and then they go higher. And they get to epogee, which is 160, and then they'll, they'll meet with Mir. They could do that <coughs> now, but they're choosing to give the astronauts some time to adjust to being in space before they actually do the docking. So they probably won't dock until the day after tomorrow. They're just going to give them a chance to kind of get their sea legs. <coughs> this platform. Each one is on four bolts. And they're stacked so symmetrical that they actually are mated for life. Okay? This one, because of the way it's designed, has to match ounce for ounce, quarter of an ounce for quarter of an ounce with this one on all sides. And as they're mated, they're stacked one on top of another, as four pieces put together. Then we bring the big orange tank and slide it down between them. Okay? The tank is empty when we do that. The boosters are full of fuel, but the tank is empty. The tank still weighs 50,000 pounds. I mean, we're talking a lot of weight, but it's Mickey Mouse compared to these two babies. And because we set it in and then we bolt them together, one up here, three down here, okay? Now we'll take the orbiter itself into the vehicle assembly building. It comes in on the horizontal and we lift it in a sling. Do you see that picture way over there? Way at the last one on yes. the left, you see the big sling? Yeah. We put the orbiter in a big sling like that, lift it up to the roof, and then very gently ease it down so it comes down here and put it into space place. Now this, the pressure of this is holding this in place. And then when we bolt this to this, just by one bolt here at the tip, and then we connect the two 17-inch hose lines, that's the geometry that's holding this to here. These hold this in, and it's perfectly symmetrical. I mean, there isn't, there isn't a fraction that's off. And it, that has to be that way because even at launch, it's de it demands it because we're going to let these three engines actually push us to the center of gravity. We have to know exactly where the center of gravity is and it can't be off a little bit because if it is, the whole thing will wobble like crazy. Okay? So it's the, the mathematics has to be perfect. That's, that's really the key is math. So that's awesome. And the fuel wants to evaporate up. And of course, as it's evaporating, boiling up, it's just like a tea kettle. It'll, it'll want to pop its cork. So we want to keep this. Actually, this white spot, we're going to pop this just before we uh, let go of this tank up in space. The last thing we do when we blow the bolt and disconnect this is to use telemetry to pop this top. And the reason we do that is because, of course, we're so high up, we can't put out a parachute for this because there's no air to catch the parachute. And as this tumbles back, we want it to catch air. See, And if it catches air, then it'll tumble. And it's the tumbling action that makes it burn up on re-entry. See, and we don't want this to fall in your backyard. We want it to burn up. And that's why we pop the top so that it catches air. And then it makes it forces it to tumble. He, he just loved this one.
Discovery is on its way to Russian space station Mir. Thousands watched a successful liftoff at 6.06 .06 Tuesday evening. Move from main engine start. Four, three, two, one, zero. We have booster ignition and liftoff of the spatial Discovery as NASA embarks on the final mission to dock with Russia's space station Mir. Then. Wendy, the soaring Mercury did force the launch team into some unusual steps to keep things going today, but extreme weather did not stand in the way of success for the 91st space shuttle launch. Text on the net, all systems, the spy will be rebooted. To As the astronauts were squeezing in aboard their spaceship, the launch team began to battle the record heat. And the access arm is being retracted. Mission managers worried that the heat might keep the crew access arm from swinging out of the way on time before liftoff. So they moved up the launch time three minutes to give themselves extra time to solve that and any other heat-related problems that might arise. The only thing that arose was discovery. The signature rumble of the booster rocket seemed more intense. The Earth and nearby buildings shook. The ninth and final mission to the Russian space station was underway, and the blazing late afternoon sun only made it stand out that much more clearly in the blue sky. Two minutes into the flight, booster rockets separated and Discovery was set to chase down Mir. The shuttle was equipped with a new lightweight fuel tank made of a special alloy, 7,500 pounds lighter than the previous tanks. It passed its first and toughest test. Everybody's doing great, and uh, vehicle's just doing outstanding. Copy all Discovery, and it was quite a show. Anytime you're flying a new piece of equipment, people will, of course, give it a little extra attention, and all of us, I think, breathed a sigh of relief. Discovery docks with Mir on Thursday. On board Mir, Andy Thomas awaits after a four-month stay. Discovery is his ride home. Then, NASA turns its attention to building a new space station far larger and more complex than Mir. The space station Mir was over Europe, over the border of France and Germany, when the shuttle was launched earlier this evening. But since it was nighttime in Russia and the flight controllers had gone home, Andy Thomas on board Mir will not find out about the launch until tomorrow morning when they come back in and tell them about it. Minor problem they're working on, the shuttle's TV system is broken tonight. They're hoping very much to get that repaired before the dock.